Okay, so you are pretty well versed now on industrial melanism. Um, this should have been pretty easy after uh, the activity that we had and the previous set of notes. So let's move on. So what causes evolutionary change? Now we've had some introduction to this. Um, you may have some thoughts going through your mind. You may be thinking things like habitat changing, climate changing, and that's good. So let's build on that, okay? So if the environment changes, like global warming, for example, we know this happens. We know this happens because we can look back just 10, 12, 15 you know, or so thousand years ago to the last ice age. We have evidence that the land was frozen you know, uh, more than it is now and that there were um, <clears throat> glaciers that my, my hometown would not exist without a glacier from you know, 12,000 years ago. So mammoths, saber-toothed cats, bones we can find right here in, in Florida. Um, we know that environmental change causes certain species to die off quickly or to develop new traits. Okay, <clears throat> makes them more suited to the environment, better chance of surviving and passing on those genes. I've said that over and over and over again because that's the main concept, all right? They, but um, that should be if, so fix that in your notes, but if they do not have traits suited to the new environment, they will die and their genes will disappear, just like the moths. You went around, and you grab those moths that you saw, you little birdies, and those moths' genes are out of the gene pool, pool and any moths that are left over, they will survive, maybe, long, long enough to have offspring and pass those genes on to their offspring, okay? So a species can adapt to a changing environment. Species not an individual. Again, you cannot will yourself to have more fur or longer nails or more blubber to survive in the cold, like a, like a cold surviving creature, a polar bear or a walrus or something, okay? Some of the, if some of the individuals have traits suited to the environment. So there's gonna be a, you know, a horse that can survive desert conditions more than other horses, and that horse will survive if we go, you know, if, it, if an area gets desertified, turned into a desert, desertification. So therefore, diversity is important. You look around the classroom, and it's, it's a good thing that everybody's different for our species. It's a good thing that there are people with different skin color and different hair thickness and different um, abilities to fight germs and different diseases. So in, remember, individuals cannot change. Remember this from Ice Age, it's really funny, um, which is not the true story. So nothing in Ice Age is really true, uh, please. So individuals cannot change to fit the environment. Rather, they have an advantageous phenotypes to survive and reproduce, and then the babies, the species evolves, right? An individual's fitness is the contribution it makes to the gene pool of the next generation. So an example, another example, the organism must have good enough traits not only to survive, not just survival is not enough, they have to survive and have babies. And those babies have to survive also, okay? To pass that, to make the species be able to evolve. Organisms producing few offspring and take a long time to grow may evolve more slowly. And that's called K-selected. So elephants, for example. 
and then opposite of that, organisms that produce, reproduce quickly and produce multiple, many, lay lots of eggs or have multiple things, like rabbits, for example. Rabbits can uh, have offspring, like four litters a year, whereas humans can have one, you know, four litters of like six babies or whatever, four, six, eight babies a year. That's, do the math. It's like, you know, 30 or so offspring every year, whereas humans can have one a year, one a year. And those rabbits by the end of the year can now make their own babies. Whereas humans can't make babies for like 14 years, however long individuals take between, you know, 12 and 16, whatever it is. <clears throat> and so they can evolve more rapidly, organisms like a butterfly. So that's called R-selected. So what's the connection here? Or what is a connection here? Endangered species often have reduced var variation, excuse me, variation and low genetic variability. So some example, would, an example would be a panda bear. This may reduce the capacity of endangered species to survive as humans continue to alter their environment, stupid humans. Less diversity means there is less of a chance that some members of the species have variations. The more diversity, the better a species' chance of survival. Surviving that environmental change. Now, not all environmental changes are human-related. For example, and this is a long story, so we won't go too deep into this right now, but global warming and um, climate change are the same thing but different, okay? Because climate change is really just a natural phenomenon. The sun and the earth go through cycles, and those cycles make colder and warmer seasons. You know, uh, not seasons, but uh, time periods. It's happened in the past without people. We've had warmer regions where all the ice caps melt and Florida is totally covered by water except for a couple of islands in the middle of Florida. Humans weren't even around back then, so humans didn't cause that. And then we've had cold snaps, ice ages over the years, every 15 or you know thousand or so years we've had ice ages. And humans were barely around. You know, they weren't burning fossil fuels, so it wasn't humans' fault. So a lot of people saying that the climate change that we're going through right now is all because of people. The temperature may not necessarily be because of the people. Plastic is. Plastic pollution is definitely all humans. And that's probably where we should focus our efforts right now is on waste pollution in the oceans and, and everywhere. Okay, so how do, we rep how do we represent evolution? Now we're gonna talk more about pictures like this in the next section called um, biodiversity and, and um, classification. But for, we're gonna introduce this, this lineage thing here, okay? So the history of life is like a tree. If you remember the very first little video, introductory video that I showed you guys, that tree of life was introduced there. Whoa. The root represents, that one popped up first, that's crazy. The root represents a common ancestor, which we, I think, talked about before. And the branches are the descendants. It's kind of like a, it's a family tree. But not generation to generation, species to species. So we're, this is not 25 years in a family tree. This is more like 25 million years or 25,000 years or something like that, some great number of years. As you move from the root to the tips, you're moving forward through time. So this is the descendants of that ancestor. And this is the past and this is more recent. It's very simple. 
Some branches survive from the beginning with very little change. So, um, like this one. Something, some common ancestor branched off to these two, and that one continued to survive today. This could be like uh, the alligators here in Florida. They've been around since the time of the dinosaurs without much change. Or um, a horseshoe crab, or sharks, okay? They haven't changed much in 65 million years. That could be their branch. But then, this could be other types of reptiles that have branched off from that common ancestor. So that's just an example. So other branches split repeatedly with every branch representing a new word that's not there, a new species. That's supposed to say species, right there. Species, spelled like this, but I-E-S, okay? <clears throat> And this is called speciation. Every time a new species, species, there it is, uh, is, comes about, forms, that's called speciation. And we talked about that with Darwin's finches. When they went to the Galapagos Islands and speciated, spread out into other, from one finch to multiple other finches. Each lineage has an ancestor, and that is known as a common ancestor. Common ancestor of these two. Common ancestor of all three of these. And that one's the common ancestor of these two. And, and not related really to that one except for, well, they have a common ancestor, yeah, so. So the common ancestor of two siblings include their parents and grandparents. The common ancestor of a coyote and a wolf include the first canine and the first mammal. Oh, there, huh, I don't know why these are backwards. Okay, so as lineages evolve, lineage, what word is in lineage? Line and we, you could probably look at it this way. It's probably not correct to do this, but ages. So lines showing, you know, through the ages, lineages. Kind of made that up, but it makes sense. Um, as lineages evolve and split, modifications are inherited, adaptations, uh, you know, modifications are inherited by the next generation. Evolutionary paths diverge, this is divergent evolution. And this process, uh, this produces a branching pattern showing evolutionary relationships. So we can see that ancestral protists, this is a, a modern day protist called a um, paramecium, but ancestral protists gave way to all of these creatures. Sponges were first, then corals branched off, and something else branched off here, then the common ancestor of these two went this way and this way, giving snails from that one, earthworms and insects came, and from this one, sea stars, and then mammals branched off from sea stars long ago. So by studying characteristics of these organisms that are inherited through, you know, by this tool, um, scientists can reconstruct evolution to represent this family tree. And this family tree, I mentioned this word like last week sometime, is known as phylogeny. So this is a phylogeny a tree, okay? The evolutionary relationships among organisms, it looks like a family tree, a phylogeny. So the tree is made using many forms of evidence, and that's obvious. We know that none of this is um, just someone's belief or someone's opinion. This is a theory, and remember, theories are based on facts, evidence. When new evidence comes in, the theory changes. 
Scientists are continually reevaluating because of the new evidence. Now remember, a hypothesis is a possible explanation, and then it has to be tested by many people and get the same results, and then you get a theory. As scientists gather new data, data, evidence, facts, all three of those words are synonymous. They sometimes need to rearrange some of the branches of the tree, especially when that DNA came into play, like in the late 80s, early 90s, when, you know, hyenas, remember the hyena question? We had to rearrange the tree. We thought hyenas phylogeny was related to dogs and cats. It's not. In the last 50 years, new evidence suggests that birds are descendants from dinosaurs. This is how my, one of the things, pieces of information that Michael Crichton, the author of Jurassic Park and other stories in that line, and um, came up with that idea that birds are descendants. He didn't come up with the idea. He used it in his, in his novel. Um, that birds are descendants of dinosaurs. And that required an adjustment to several of the vertebrate twigs on the tree. When you're adjusting the vertebrate twigs, that's big news. When, you're, when you learn that something is no, something that everyone thought for a very long time was related to one thing and it's not, that, up, that upsets the whole scientific community in a good way. So here are some questions. We only have five slides left after this, or maybe six. Um, which species is the common ancestor to all? Don't call out. Yes, A. Which species can still be found today? Raise your hand. D, E, and I literally says present. What's the most recent common ancestor to E? I gave that one away. E and I is F, okay? See? E and I, re common ancestor. What happened to species C? This is present day, remember. Is species C up here? No, what happened to it? Uh, uh, extinct, went extinct. You, your species could not tolerate whatever environmental changes were going on, and you are selected against, and your species goes extinct. And what's more related, um, E and I, there should be a comma there, or D and I. E and I, or D and I. And if you said E and I, you are correct because they share the most recent common ancestor. Do D and E share a common ancestor? Yeah, but it's further back in time. It's pretty easy to read those things. Okay, what common ancestor do all animals have? Here. And if you said protozoa, which animal phyla probably evolved first? These are all Phyla, the mollusca phylum, the anthrop anthropoda phylum, the echinodermata phylum. If you are in marine science, which very few of you are, um, you might recognize some of these. But we're going to talk more about these different phyla groups of uh, organisms in the next section, the next unit after evolution. So, um, which one, which animal phyla probably evolved first? Periphera, those are sponges. Pores, sponges have pores, periphera. Which phylum seems to be the most closely related to arthropods? Arthropod means jointed leg, like a crab or an, uh, an, an ant or an insect. And that would be the annelids, the worms. Annelidia, annelida are worms, like an uh, earthworm. Which animal phylum evolved last? Remember, this is 
far distant, and this is the top is the present. So yes, the chordata, that's the chordates. A spinal cord, chordata, anything with a spinal cord is in that phylum. Everything else, none of these have bones, except those. And what does chordata refer to? And that's spinal cord, that's your answer there. Hey, you learn something new every day. Test yourself. We're going to do these together. It's only uh, four questions. I don't know. It's only a few questions. So, you ready? The diagram here represents a variety of fossil types, which can be found in many rocks. So we've got bones, skin impressions, eggs in a nest, fossilized poop. It's called a coprolite. And footprints. These fossils can be best used to provide information that could be used in the study of which of those answers. Evolutionary relationships. That's what we're talking about here. According to the theory of biological evolution, most present day species of organisms what? Discuss amongst yourselves. Did they develop from similar, smaller, prehistoric organisms? Have they always existed in the form they have today? Did they develop from fossils of other organisms? What? And descended from earlier different species of organisms. So remember that trick you have of deleting the ones that definitely don't make sense. And those would be the two middle ones. So A and D are your only possibilities here. So which one is it? Smaller prehistoric organ? That doesn't make any sense either, okay? So the only one left over was D. Different species, earlier different species. Here is a red-winged blackbird. It's one of my favorite birds. Um, I have a lot of favorites. It's not my most favorite bird, but it's one of my favorites. Um, it, it sings a song. It sings a song that sounds like Ogalia. That's what it sounds like when, it's, uh, when a male is calling for a female. And they live in the reeds um, of freshwater lakes and ponds. You're going to definitely see them all over this part of Florida. The more you go west of here towards the Everglades, the more of these guys you're going to see. And they're called red-winged blackbirds because they have a red spot on their wing. Now they defend its territory and that loud vocalization to attract a mate. Such behavior directly benefits these birds because it results in what? Increased competition. Increased competition. Greater reproductive success. Okay. Defending its territory. Go back to the question. And attracting a mate. What's the question saying? Reduced biodiversity has nothing to do with it. Global stability. Why is that? Even there. So we know the answer is G, uh, GB, greater reproductive success. Four, extinction occurs when the environment changes and something else. So what? A species can reproduce successfully? That doesn't make sense. An individual has adaptive characteristics insufficient to allow survival? Okay, that's a possibility. All members of a species are no longer living. Hmm. An individual. Does an individual go extinct? If I, get, if I die right here, am I extinct? No. Extinction refers to a species. And then finally, so C is looking pretty good, right? One individual, again, same thing. One individual is the wrong answer. So it's all members of a species are no longer living. Five, antibiotics are substances used to help fight an infection. We know this. Um, streptococcus is a type of infection. It's a bacteria that causes strep throat, among some other things. Uh, overuse of antibiotics. We had a discussion about this in our last set of notes. 
Overuse can prevent future infections. The more antibiotics you take, is what A is saying, the better off you'll be. That doesn't make sense. Cause a decrease in the production of enzymes, not related. Allow organic molecules to be synthesized. That's virtually the same type of answer as B. Select for resistant organisms. And we know that's the answer. We know D is the answer. All right, six and seven. Which organic compound would be best to analyze in order to determine if two species are closely related? Would we analyze fats, starches, sugars, or proteins? Based upon our previous notes, you should know which one of these we would look at. It was DNA, RNA, and what other substance? Amino acids, right? And what do amino acids make up? proteins. In the past, humans developed varieties of dogs such as the German Shepherd and the Bearded Collie using what? Did they selectively breed for particular traits? Did they recombine genes during mitosis? Mitosis, not meiosis. Mutations present only in body cells. Same thing, mitosis and body cells. Same thing. Natural selection. Humans developed varieties. Is that natural selection? No. So the answer must be selective breeding. Number eight and nine. Here's a photograph showing two penguins of the same species Look around the classroom again, okay? Variety, all right? Um, with different feather color. The newly discovered all black penguin had only black feathers instead uh, since emerging from the egg. The sudden appearance of this characteristic was likely due to what? Was it a change in environmental conditions? Was it deposition of oil due to pollution? since emerging from the egg. A random change in the sequences of bases in DNA. Okay, number eight and number nine. Two penguins, same species, same species, except this one, since it emerged from the egg, it's been black. It never had white feathers. What could have caused that sudden appearance in, in feather color. Did something change in the environment? Did oil spill on the bird? A random change in the sequence of bases in DNA giving it a different color? Or did the diet of the chick change? It's eating the same food as the other birds, so it's the random, random change in sequences. It's a, it's a, it's a variation. That's all it is. It may or may not give it a survive, survivability advantage. May or may not. Um, this one, hawk eating the mice. And it's, it's definitely selecting against the white mice and the gray mice that are more camouflaged, just like the moths. You know the answer is natural selection. Overall change in population is natural selection. All right, this one's a little bit longer. The Galapagos pink land iguana is native to only one of the Galapagos Islands on Isabella Island. Its entire range is limited to a, a certain volcano called Wolf Volcano. It was first discovered in 86, 1986. Genetic studies sometime later, and it was identified as a species separate from other iguanas in 2009. Uh, its population might have been as high as 100. But since then, only 10 animals have been able to be found. Only 10. So evidence indicates the species could have diverged from another line of iguanas about 5.7 million years ago. That's the best evidence we have. 
After that, the other line of iguanas diverged into two other species. So these were left over, and then the other line turned into these two species. So in the future, number 10, in the future, a current population of about 10 pink land iguanas will probably, what, migrate to survive? You think they adapt better to a changing environment? Soon become extinct because they have little genetic diversity? or undergo evolution by natural selection and survive. According to the data that's up in there, you know, they're probably going to become extinct soon. Probably because they don't have any genetic diversity. All right, the testing, that, the testing in 2009 that separated these species most likely included DNA analysis, because we know that that's the way they do it, and then finally, one likely reason for the existence of these pink land iguanas today is that their ancestors, what? Did they have some variations after a long period of environmental conditions mutated to the pink form? When the environment stabilized, had B, do they have variations not present in other iguanas, allowing them to live in a particular environment more successfully than the other iguanas? C, did they live in several other islands long ago, but migrated to Isabella Island around 1900 to have the environment to themselves without predators to harm them? Or D, found that they were less visible to predators if they made themselves pink. If you even thought about D. So D is definitely the answer. So what, which one of those is, I'll let you read them a, a quick second again. The answer there is had variations not present in other iguanas that allowed them to live in a particular environment more successful than the other. It, the, the key here is always more successful. The reason for anything's existence is because it was more successful than others, okay? In that particular environment. All right, that's our notes for part Four, um, your next assignment awaits.